Gold, which is currently trading at 2016, could surge by 50% if central banks sharply ramp up purchases of the yellow metal, a possible stagflation, or in the case of a deep global recession. Well, the Embridge is, is certainly going to be a big part of it. We've been talking about the Embridge for about a year now, which is a way for these countries to, and I'm glad you brought this up because to me, this is a very important point. You know, the Embridge is a bridge that allows these these digital currencies, these nations' currencies to trade with one another, um, sidestepping the SWIFT system, which is the the way that the United States imposes, one of the ways they impose sanctions. And, you know, maybe I'm guilty as well of focusing too much on the Russian finance minister's proclamation that, hey, we're going to have a uh, a... a unified settlement currency that will be pegged to a basket of commodities. And maybe that will happen, right? But look at what's been happening, right? If you look at uh, China, as an example, at one point, they had almost $3 trillion worth of our treasuries. They're down to seven or 800 billion. It's still a lot, but they are shedding treasuries at a rapid rate, the lowest level they've had in 17, 16, 17, 18 years. And the same thing is is true of many of these 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 BRICS nations that are no longer bidding for our treasury. So when you think about it, you know, we were told at the end of the August meeting that they would all go back, the finance ministers, to the drawing board, come back and present their findings for a common settlement currency. But in the meantime, everyone trade in their local currencies. And that is indeed what we are seeing in more proclamations all throughout the BRICS nations, whether it be India, whether it be Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, you know, um, uh, Russia, they're all trading with one another using local currencies. And the difference, the delineation here, when we talk about that particular move, right, trading outside the dollar in local currencies, well, you know, we saw 20% of oil sales uh, settle in, in other currencies this year. That's a big a divergence, but as we continue to see this BRICS conglomerate grow, and and there's another 35 countries that have formally applied, and 20 that have expressed interest, and this mass adoption grows, and all of these countries agree to trade in local currencies. Remember, the petrodollar is not just the dollar being uh, the what oil is sold for. That's part of it. The other part was taking the excess and the reserves and putting it into U.S. treasuries. So, number one, you start to chip away at the settlement status of the dollar, which is is big deal, especially as we see more and more and more of these oil producing countries be part of the the, the BRICS group and and all of these countries that produce the world's commodities as part of this group that always settled in dollars will now settle in local currencies. And instead of taking that excess, the the excess currency that they would otherwise have just sitting there earning nothing, they would typically put it into U.S. treasuries, which are very liquid and very safe. Well, instead, what you're seeing is two plus years, almost three years in a row of the central banks, the people who know the playbook, not just the wealthiest, but the most well-informed buying gold at levels the world's never seen. And now you're seeing all the exchanges being bled dry, a continuation of what we've been talking about for three years. What does that mean? That means they're selling treasuries, not rolling them over and reinvesting them, but instead buying gold. And look at this, the the look at the how that's played out for the last 24 years. If you go back to 2000, gold is appreciated by 7.8% per year. The S&P, 7%. And the bond market, less than half of that. So you have no default risk, no counterparty risk. It's an asset that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. You have much less in the way of interest and inflation risk as it pertains to using gold instead of U.S. treasuries as the replacement for the reserve. So if they settle in other currencies and put the excess into gold, as it very much appears like they are doing, you will begin to rapidly, and I mean rapidly, chip away at the dollar hegemony. And I think it's important to note, you know, you look at what the lead analyst for Citibank said. I want to read this to you real quick. <clears throat> Gold, which is currently trading at 2016, could surge by 50% if central banks sharply ramp up purchases of the ye yellow metal, a possible stagflation, or in the case of a deep global recession. 
Uh, Akash Doshi, City's North American Head of Commodities Research, told CNBC. But here's where it fits in here. He says, the most likely wildcard path to $3,000 per ounce gold is a rapid acceleration of an existing but slow-moving trend. De-dollarization across emerging markets, central banks that in turn leads to a crisis of confidence in the U.S. dollar. Well, I mean, how is there not already a crisis of confidence in the U.S. dollar with the amount of inflation, with the destabilization of the bond market, with the sanctioning and weaponizing and now confiscating? I think that those confiscation um, aspirations of not just sanctioning, but taking it to fund the Ukraine will have massive consequences where we will never be trusted again by li literally anyone in the Southern Hemisphere, if not much more wide reaching. So I think this is happening and it doesn't have to come under the, the guise of a common settlement currency yet. Maybe that's down the road, but the fact of not trading in dollars and not buying treasuries will have a very big effect, a very big effect. And I think it's happening right now. When I when I, you know, in the 90s, no one bought bullion, nobody. And people only bought numismatics. And with $350 gold, you'd pay $380 for a gold eagle and $410 for a certified, uncirculated MS62 $20 Liberty. There'd be no reason to buy bullion when you could buy a hundred year old coin that was safe from confiscation, was a piece of Americana, was a real piece of history that had much better upside potential. For 30 bucks more, well, you know, that was 9% more or whatever, but so what? Um, and when I was accumulating those coins early on in my career, that's all I would buy myself. I never really bought it because I was concerned about confiscation. I bought it because they are really a true rarity. They're 100 plus years old. And technically, they, they would be safe from confiscation according to the way the laws are written. But there's something about them when you're looking at a coin from you know the 1880s 1870s 1890s early 1900s you're looking at a coin that's a hundred plus years old when the world was very different um there's something to be said for it and i think that the wow factor is is you know you get that for free that's great um and the, i've never ever met anyone who who has looked at a $20 gold piece. I mean, most people don't know that gold was money prior to 1933, but you put a 100-year-old $20 gold piece in someone's hands and the, it's universal. Wow, that is so cool. I think there's something to be said for that. So it's just, I was always drawn to them. I gravitated to them. and But since 2008, the premiums got so high that I had to move away from it because in reality, as Richard Russell said, in the end, it's about the number of ounces that matter. But you have to tailor that with, you know, not being penny wise and pound foolish. And I guess if you were able to get the pre-33 coins in the same ballpark as the new stuff, yeah, I, I would do it. I do prefer it and always have. And there's something to be said for something that, you know, it's not rare, but it's not common either. And there's it's just a really neat way to accumulate gold. Just my personal preference more than anything. And, you know, do it the right way. And, and you do, in theory, have safety from, from any governmental shenanigans.